Hello and welcome to the I3 lecture series hosted by the Masters in Digital Photography program at the School of Visual Arts. We are thrilled to have fine artist Muriel Haspun as tonight's guest speaker. Uh, originally from El Salvador, Muriel is currently based in Washington, D.C., where she is professor and program head of photography at GWU Corporate School of Arts and Design. Muriel is a 2014 Smithsonian Artist Fellow. She has also been awarded a Howard Chapnick Grant, the Maryland State Arts Council Grant in Photography twice, in 2015 and 2012, as well as in Media, 2008 a Museums Connect grant, an Escuela de Bellas Artes, Artists in Residence in Mexico, the Corcoran's Outstanding Creative Research Faculty Award, and a Fulbright Scholar grant. Recent exhibitions include Centro Cultural de España in San Salvador, Smithsonian American Art Museum in 2013 and in 2011, the Mac Dallas in the Michael Masio Gallery in 2010, and the American University Museum 2008. Um, Muriel's work is in the permanent collections of the Art Museum of the Americas, District of Columbia Art Bank, and Foco Lehigh University, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, and the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. So please help me welcome Muriel Hasman to our lecture series. Okay. Thank you, Jaime. Um, that's really kind of you, and thank you for the invitation. I would like to thank the School of Visual Arts for inviting me and all of you for coming on this rainy night. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here and um, I'm going to give you a little bit of a journey through my work. Um, I realized as I was putting this together that one of the photographs um, I had made 30 years ago, so it's kind of crazy, but uh, at the same time, um, really wonderful to be excited about work even you know through 30 years, so I'm really excited about that. So um, my work really deals a lot with um, identity, cultural memory, and the sense of place, basically. And so if you think about how it is that somebody constructs an identity, many times we go through photographs, and actually photographs have been a great, great vehicle for me to kind of reconstitute and uh, put together an identity. So as um, Jaime said, I'm originally from El Salvador, but I also have a very hybrid identity, um, and you will learn about that through my work um, as I have used my work very much to give a sense of what that's about, not only for all of you in the result, but also for myself. So um, here we have, I was trying to figure out, since we didn't have titles for the talk, you know, what should I call it? And so I decided to call it In the Archive. But then at the same time, I was thinking that it's definitely through the lens, you know, through the lens of photography, through the lens of media. And in some ways, both of these photographs give, me, give you and, my, and me a sense of how it is that familial relationships have been very important in the way that I have become an artist. Um, my mother owned an art gallery in El Salvador during the Civil War, and my father was a photographer, um, also a dentist, but he was a really good photographer, and I learned photography from him. So uh, clearly finding this photograph, and that's pretty recent that I found it, I don't know who took it, um, me at the beach, you know, look, you know, kind of like looking at my father, you know, taking some, making some Super 8 film was really moving to me. Um, and at the same time, it's, I, I, you know, finding these two photographs of my mother's eye and my eye that he took of us and then putting them together was, you know, a way of just kind of starting to build something looking back now that both my parents have passed. So, um, then this is the photograph that I just made this weekend, actually. And I thought, wow, you know, 30 years. Like, the original photograph that this is made from um, was made in 1986 when I visited my grandmother who lived in Paris. And um, just recently, in my mother's things, I found this piece of cloth 
um, that reminded me that it was exactly from the dress that my grandmother was wearing that day that I photographed her. So, you know, it's those kinds of connections that I find in my work and that I'm always trying to build uh, between one thing and the other, be it documents, photographs, etc., or objects, that I have kind of created this, this, you know, many bodies of work that try to tell the story of my family, the story of my, of different diasporas, of different exiles from different places, um, at the same time that um, I'm, you know, creating a new sense of identity for myself. Now, this eventually becomes beyond me. Um, it's not just for me, but um, clearly I want to share that sense with all of you. So, um, you know, photographs are very um, important to us in this 21st century, even though now uh, they're so ubiquitous, they're everywhere. They're, you know, we have so many photographs in our world that we don't even know what to do with them. But at the same time, you know, photographs have had a really, really important piece of building history and legacy. And that's how I've used photography quite a bit. I have used photography as a way, or photographs as a way, to access other people and um, as kind of like passports um, to, you know, sometimes between family members, maybe there, there wasn't a way of communicating or there had been a rift through the generations. And I would always ask, do you have any photographs? And that was a way of becoming, you know, getting closer or starting a conversation. Um, and this is a photograph that my great uncle um, took as a self-portrait, you know, a tripod. He set up a tripod and he built, he took this picture. He, this is a great uncle of my paternal family um, who came from Bethlehem to El Salvador at the beginning of the 20th century. And um, this is one of the first images that they probably made there. Um, and you have it, you know, this nuclear family in a place that looks like it's a virgin landscape. Obviously, we all know that it isn't, but that's how it looks, you know, in that photograph. And so many times, you know, photography has already a language that we appropriate in some way because we we have seen photographs even at the beginning of the 20th century. There was already a language, and so to you know come to El Salvador as immigrants but at the same time make a photograph that looks as if nobody lives there. It's pretty amazing, right? So um, that's, that's something to kind of think about. And so through, through my work, I've, I've created this journey, this kind of path of um, trying to build a relationship between what's very personal, personal histories with a collective history. And this um, is, you know, again, through the photograph, just like, you know, photographs are like evidence. You know, this is the photograph that I imagine my um, great-grandfather and his brother sent back to Bethlehem to say we made it, you know, and I've reworked it. Um, and um, so it kind of gives us this, this familiarity, but at the same time, it it asks so many questions, you know, like who are these people? You know, who are these men looking out at us? They, they are in a studio setting, but, you know, at the same time, it's sort of evanescent. Like we really can't quite grasp like who they were just from a photograph. But at the same time, we hold a lot on a photograph, especially with a gelatin silver print that actually is made of silver particles that contain the light that reflected off a person that really creates a very important presence um, and an absence at the same time, like Roland Barthes said very, very eloquently. So um, we, um, we come into this body of work, which I did in the 90s. It took me about mostly the whole decade, like seven years, to create this body of work that became as two different, that started out as two different bodies of work one that I called Todos los Santos, or All the Saints, and the other one, Only a Shadow, or, um, yeah, just, just <laughs> Only a Shadow, or Solo una Sombra, like mix the English and the Spanish, sorry. Um, but 
eventually, as I start, I, as I continued working, I realized, well, you know, these are actually the same series. So I called it Santos y Sombras, or Saints and Shadows, um, because they make up my own identity. And although at some point when I began making this work, it felt like it was divided through the work, it became integrated. And I, Muriel Elena, had to be a saint, like Tere, who drowned. Um, and there's photographs that I'm editing through here, but basically it's like this whole idea that my grandfathers, well, grandparents, both my grandparents who emigrated from Bethlehem to El Salvador at the beginning of World War I, right before World War I and at World, during World War I, were escaping um, Ottoman rule and being drafted into the Ottoman Empire, uh, into the, yeah, into the army, and um, they came to El Salvador, and so they became assimilated into the society in El Salvador, but they were Christian, and um, they, it was easier for them to become very saintly very Catholic. Um, it was a way to assimilate into the society instead of um, bearing the prejudice that existed towards Arabs and that continues in many places, as we all know. So um, the work kind of gives you a journey or into the, my own experiences or the emotional aura of my experiences as I was growing up in El Salvador and kind of by kind of identifying with whatever it was that these, you know, subjective emotional ways of expression that I somehow soaked in. And that's what became Todos Los Santos. And here you have my great grandfather's altar. Um, in the process of the work, I also realized that the family had not only always been Catholic, but that they were also Greek Orthodox. And um, this is uh, an altar that my great-grandfather built in his own home. And here you see him in the photograph that's on the altar, although it appears as if he's there, um, and as well as my grandmother. She was like a lady of sorrows. She had lost her child and her husband and the, my great aunt who told me about her said that she was, that she had suffered a lot. And here is the Volcán de Izalco, which is spewing a Greek Orthodox prayer in Arabic script. Um, and that was written by my great grandfather and I found it in, on, in that altar. Um, and so, you know, in some ways, Making this photograph was kind of a transgressive act for me. It was difficult. Um, it took me about five months to finally have the courage to make it. Um, and just to kind of give you a little bit of context, so this volcano is um, a symbol of the Salvadoran landscape. It was in every single tourism poster that existed when I was growing up. Um, it was spewing lava and smoke through the 20th century up, a, up until maybe 1955 or 1958. And it was called um, El Faro del Pacifico, or um, the Lighthouse of the Pacific, because boats could see it from the ocean. And um, so there was also, in 1932, a massacre that happened in that region. Um, so it's a loaded, loaded landscape. It's a loaded place. And here I was going to put Arabic script on top of it to kind of give the idea of the presence of the immigrant to the Salvadoran, in the Salvadoran soil. So I did it and you know, it's there now, it lives now. It's like part of what it is. And so um, in trying to kind of come to terms with like all of these different um, strands of my own identity. You know, of course, I read a lot and, and try to figure out like what other people are saying about identity and things like that. 
And um, Hal Foster has said some wonderful things in his essay about the archival artist. And in some ways, you could think that I am an archival artist because I dig through archives and I make work out of that. Um, he says, in the first instance, archival artists seek to make historical information often lost or displaced physically present. And paraphrasing, in so doing, they establish a site of alternative knowledge or counter memory. So, you know, that totally makes sense to me. I think that that's, you know, I, I really um, find that especially this photograph kind of embodies that kind of alternative site of counter memory. It is not part of the national discourse or was not part of the national discourse of El Salvador when I was growing up, but it certainly is now. So, you know, it's just like it, it requires unearth, unearthing this, this kind of knowledge. It requires digging through things and thinking about what are the different strands that are not avowed or that are not said or that are not given their place. Um, same thing for um, the only a shadow images where you know they're basically unearthing the, the silence voices of a maternal Jewish family um, and I'm hoping to regenerate them from burnt ash into glimmering light. These are Esther's poems from Bergen Belsen. I met Esther um, in 1993, two, 93, whatever the date, yeah, 93. So a year later, I made this photograph. But um, the reason, the way I met her was that um, my grandfather thought that he was the only survivor from the Holocaust. Um, and he and Esther found each other in 1974. Esther thought that she was the only survivor, and my grandfather, Georges, thought that he was the only survivor. So somehow, you know, eventually, they, they met. And um, my grandfather wrote at that time to my mother and told her about Esther. My mother buried the little piece of paper. And when I started doing this work, about a year later, she told me about Esther. She gave me her address. And I immediately wrote to her. And she luckily still lived in Haifa. And um, <clears throat> so we went to see her. And so, of course, this, is, this was like a watershed moment for me, you know, like a whole life that I didn't even know about, um, a whole family that I didn't know about um, opened up. And she and I became really, really close, um, even though we didn't see each other very much. Um, so Esther, um, when I came back, I was like, how do I, how can I even do justice to her, to her story. Um, so I did the series of portraits of her. I'll, I'll uh, read something that I wrote. Um, In my dark room, I was looking at the portrait of Esther, its image projected on the paper. Only a shadow? Impossible. The brittle leaves from an earlier autumn had already been transformed by the light. Upon finishing the portraits, I wrote to Esther, when I make these pictures, cuando hago estas fotografías, it's as if I were finding what has been underneath the shadows. Es como que si encontrara lo que estaba debajo de las sombras, or what lives inside our hearts, o lo que vive dentro de nuestros corazones. She said that the first thing when she, at, when she came to Palestine um, after surviving the camps, she asked, if there were any photographs. And this was the photograph that her sister, who had emigrated in the 20s to Palestine, um, had. And here you see Esther as a baby in the photograph. And it's almost faded. And the sister who had the photograph had etched out her face because she didn't like the way she looked. Um, and, you know, and then I overlaid it um, in a wintry, wintry landscape, kind of evoking Poland. So 
you know, the photograph then becomes this vestige of a physical remnant of a past. Here's the photograph that I made of my grandmother in 1986, and here you have her, um, hold, she's holding a portrait of her in 1945 at the end of the war, um, and her two children, my mother on your left, and, um, and her brother. So um, the reason I'm, I'm giving you, I mean, I, you will see that through, through my work, I have tried to like, kind of create these stories of what happened. And in my case, much of the stories were not told. Um, they were buried. And so it became important to me as an adult, especially a Palestinian, Christian, Jewish, Salvadoran, you know, Jewish, French, Polish descent, to kind of figure out who I was. So um, it was a really important kind of path, and that's why I'm kind of taking you back there, because I think that you, will, you can only understand what my work is about if you understand that it's so much about putting together all of these different pieces, um, like Edward Said would say, because that's all that exists, pieces. So um, that's kind of what I've been doing for the last 30 years. Um, and I'm just going to give you a little bit of a sense also of how I use um, it's not just ph photographs, but I do kind of installations where I use audio um, and create these installations where the place, the place where you view the, the photographs also becomes an immersive emotional experience. So I'm just going to play this for just a little bit to kind of get a sense of that. Um, and this is the first body of work that I made that kind of tried to tell the story of my mother's hiding in France during World War II when she was a little girl. Oh, right over there, that's the river. La Dordogne. Mon petit papa, c'est aujourd'hui ta fête. Maman m'a dit que tu n'étais pas là. Mon petit papa. C'était bébé, c'était énorme, énorme. Alors, quand c'était, mais à ce moment-là, il n'y avait pas de maison comme ça. Il y avait des maisons comme le plus grand, c'était la plus grande maison. La villa toi et moi. La villa toi et moi. It was the largest house, the villa toi et moi. So I'm going to stop it there. You can hear it on my website. But um, basically, it's you know a conversation between my mother and me when we first went there. And she told me, she tried to like show me where it was that you know, she had been hidden. Um, and it was this little town in the central part of France called Le Mont d'Or, which is a volcanic place, which is amazing. So when I went there, I realized that the, land, that the, the rock of the place was exactly the same as in El Salvador. So here was this correspondence between a place across the Atlantic that supposedly has nothing to do with El Salvador. But for her and for me, it became an incredibly important thing, the fact that these two rocks were exactly the same and that the land was volcanic. So the way that I made these photographs was trying to give a sense of this intergenerational kind of transmission um, that Mariana Hirsch um, so eloquently calls post-memory in a way that we, even though we did not live a particular event, 
we still carry it within us. And when I read Marianne Hirsch's book, Family Frames, I was like, well, she's describing what my work does. So I wrote to her immediately and I said, we need to talk. <laughs> um, and basically, that's the kind of relationship that I have found that I make with, with my work. It's this dialogue between the past and the present, um, between what's very personal and what eventually you know, we all carry in some way. We all have these stories. We all have untold stories that we carry. And now, you know, all this research on epigenetics shows that we are actually carrying the effects of memories and traumatic events in our bodies. So not only, it's not, it's not just that we somehow soak it in because of our family, but somehow it's also in our genes. So it's incredible. Um, and what I did was I made these photographs on my grandmother's linens and um, created this installation so you would walk into the space and you would hear the sound repeating. Um, and it was a dialogue between photographs that I made of my mother when she had a really bad car accident and then um, I photographed her then and um, the photographs that I collected from the archive um, so I put this picture here. This is from a contact sheet. This is a photograph I never printed from when I was making that series. I knew that it was, even though my mother totally collaborated with me in pulling out this yellow star. Um, first of all, they never wore the yellow star because my grandmother refused to do it. But somehow my mother got one of these. and when she was in the hospital and afterwards when I was taking care of her, she pulled this yellow star out. And um, I knew that like, using that photograph would be like trespassing a line between her and me. Um, and you know, she was always, it was always very difficult to actually engage in conversation about this because for her, silence was survival. So um, regardless, it's, it's out now. <laughs> and um, I've, as I was continuing the work, um, Protegida Watched Over is the second iteration of telling the same story, but from different points of view. Because what I realized was that every time that I talked to somebody in the family, the story would change. And, you know how that is. You know, you can have siblings and everybody remembers different things, right? So um, I decided to make th this other installation which told the story not from Toi et moi, my mother and me's point of view, um, but from the point of view of um, my great aunt, Hélène, and um, her memories, she was already a little bit older, she was like 18, she had come to Paris as a young woman. My grandmother was about 10 years older. And so um, she actually took care of the children while my grandmother crossed the line of demarcation um, to try to get, you know, make money in different ways. And um, so she remembered different things and then also um, I, she had letters, she had photographs and this is, a photograph that I made joining a letter that my grandfather had sent from Paris to the, the children and a, a photograph that my great aunt had made, I mean, by going to a studio um, to get this picture. Because in the letter, my grandfather is asking, would you please take a picture of my two children with the coats that I'm sending? And so, you know, here you have like this kind of repairing, you know, after, after the fact um, of joining these two things together. I don't know if my grandfather ever saw the photograph or not. So Elen told me that a uh, town's official stopped her and um, asked for her identity papers. And so she went back and asked my my grandmother, what do I do? What do I do? And 
my grandmother said, well, you go back tomorrow morning, you shake his hand, and you say, and you just give him 50 francs. And so, you know, this is like the, all of the little tales of, of like, of survival. And I used images from books from, that were telling the story of the war um, to children, like this one. So this is um, Hitler, the big bad wolf. And there's sound also incorporated into this, but because of time. But it, in this case, it's a conversation in three voices. It's my great aunt, Hélène, my mother, and me. We're all talking. And then there's like memories and layers and songs and things like that. And then you also hear um, the Ave Maria being, being recited actually in I think I, re I recorded it in a church in Guatemala, in Esquipulas. Um, so my mother remembers two things. The Ave Maria, that the, at one point she was hidden in a convent. So she remembers the Ave Maria that the nuns taught her and taking ballet lessons. So those were my two clues. Those, that was like the only thing that I had in order to kind of weave this story. And the way that this, these triptychs work is that there's a, also a dorso to, to these, and the middle piece rotates. Um, so you, you can actually tell the story differently depending on what picture you're, you're looking at. So this is the chapel of the convent where she was. And um, in the back, I. I sewed these thorns that you find on the beach in El Salvador called these canales. Um, kind of, you know, we all know that the thorn is a symbol of Christianity, um, but it's also specific to my own childhood. And the, the sand is black, volcanic sand. So the other aspect of my work, which has become more and more so since I got the Fulbright grant in 2006, is that I have tried to, after I told that whole story of my life, <laughs> I've tried to also engage others in the telling of their own stories. And that was part of what I did when I went to El Salvador and, and, and through that grant. So, um, oops, sorry, that was really sensitive pad there. Um, so there's, creating spaces where um, there's like a site of exchange, you know, just like I talked before about it being like a site, a site of counter memory. Well, it's also a way to giving others voices, you know, or helping create a space where others could tell their story. So this is a, uh, an installation that I did at the Art Museum of the Americas after I came back from my Fulbright. I had collected family photographs from people who told their stories, and I put them on different, it was a black room, basically, and I put different images on the wall that people had given me from El Salvador, and I asked communities to come into the museum and put their own photographs and also write on the wall. So this is one of the interventions from the public, Generación Spanglish. And what you heard was this, um, this little piece that's like a, uh, just a minute long um, that kind of talks about my own thinking about how it was that I was losing my Spanish coming to this country. So I'll, I'll have you listen to this and you can hear, you'll see that it's bilingual and there's no, necess there's no translation. So basically you understand some things if you speak only one of the languages and you understand everything if you speak both. When I first came to the U.S. in 1980, I carried a poem by Salvadoran poet David Escobar Galindo, Para el mundo nacimos con la muerte, to the world we were born with death. In the U.S., my country had been reduced to being another Vietnam or the next Cuba. But my life had changed drastically because of the violence that was taking over the apparent simplicity of my protected childhood in El Salvador. Respiro jadeando, me muero de miedo. 
Me cuelgan las almas del lado derecho. English was taking over my consciousness. Del otro costado. I felt like I was losing the language of my terruño, my homeland. I began writing poems, holding on to my childhood memories with dear life. Que amargo me sabe. Añoro los pinos. Es linda la vista, ¿no? Sí, sí. Siempre que vengo subo. Es muy lindo. Es el último bosque. When I went back to El Salvador this past summer, I was able to confront a part of my history that I had not been able to embrace fully as a 17-year-old. ¿De dónde vienes? I was moved by people's stories and amazed by their resilience. ¿Tienes fotografías? Mi abuela tiene por aquí muy enganchado, para que no se le para que no se le terminen rápido. ¿Quiénes son? Esta es ella. Y este es mi abuelo. I encouraged everyone to bring their photos and family documents. I told them about my grandma, who was a boy of 14 and had arrived in El Salvador avoiding being conscripted Together, we could share our stories, our secrets. Como luna suspendida. Como luna, mi cabeza entre mis brazos hundida. Adelante, suspiro, sigamos nuestra huella. Migrations Unamos nuestra sangre lives. con la sal de nuestro llanto. Mi papá todo el tiempo, desde que yo me acuerdo, casi siempre vivía en Estados Unidos. Tú en from Honduras, from Nicaragua, to Costa Rica, Mexico to Cuba. Ah, ahí está, ahí está. Eh. Welcome to Intipuca to City. ¿Y alguien vive en esta casa, señor? Este es from the United States. Two million people and counting. ¿A dónde han estado? ¿En los estados? No sabes. En Virginia. En Virginia. So basically it talks about migration. You know, there's 500,000 Salvadorans in Washington DC where I live. There's 2 million in the US. Um, it's it's powerful, you know, two million people. It's a lot of people. So um, my, my hope is to be able to bridge this space, bridge the border somehow between the people there and the people here. And this site is kind of a symbolic place with photographs from both places, writings from both places can come together. And um, I'm just actually, this, is, this installation is going to open in El Salvador in a couple of weeks um, at the Sala Nacional. And so it'll be interesting because I'm going to have photographs from both places going back there. And then we'll see what else regenerates. And you know, I have other installations like this. There's uh, another piece called Barquitos de Papel, or Paper Boats, which is where I ask people to build paper boats made out of their family documents or photographs, and um, then they're added to this collective archive. And every time that it's exhibited, it just becomes bigger and bigger and bigger. And I've been showing it since 2006. So it's a way of trying to bring people together. So um, El Salvador had a civil war between for 12 years. Um, 75,000 people were killed. Um, and when I went to the Museo de la Revolución, which is a little, little museum in the eastern part of the country, I saw this photograph. It turns out that this woman, Janet, was my cousin. And when I saw the photograph, it was like this flash of light, you know, coming. And I remembered that my father, who was a dentist, had been asked to identify her body. At the same time, I was packing away my father's office in his house because he had just passed away. So I made a piece that's called Taxte con Filomena that you can see on the website because she was the oldest of five children and nobody was mentioning her anymore. Nobody would say her name, probably because she had joined the FMLN, you know, the, the guerrilla movement, and her family probably didn't approve. And also it was a really very difficult time that the fact that she had joined this movement her, all of her family was then um, in danger, so they had to flee. So this is a photograph that my father had made of Janet when she was a baby, and then that's the photograph that I found at the Museo de la Revolución. 
So when I came back um, a few, a couple years after that, I uh, decided to make a body of work that meditates on the effects of trauma on the body. Um, and basically, um, in Walter Mignolo's words, this archive is both ingrained in the body and in local histories. So it's a way of honoring all of our traumas, all of the effects, all everybody's, um, whatever it is that we carry inside us. And it's a way of looking at our insides as if it were a landscape. So this is, these are the photographs that I edited from my father's archive of dental x-rays that belonged to his own patients. And then in one of the iterations of the, uh, one of the exhibitions, I also asked um, people to write draw or whatever it is that they wanted to do on one of my photographs that was on this table. So um, the other hat I wear is as teacher. <laughs> so I have been taking students to El Salvador since 2007. And um, it's a way to kind of create this laboratory where um, together, collectively, um, we can learn about the history and culture of a country and at the same time become advocates for a knowledge that expands the social, historical, and cultural narrative of El Salvador and its diaspora. So um, as part of this effort, um, I've taught it different ways and different, you know, at different times, but after my mother passed away, I decided that I would make the class kind of the center of the, the project that would tell the legacy of her gallery, which was an incredible place during the Civil War um, when, you know, there was a war um, and there were artists making work about this time. So, um, this archive and this collection is a really important piece of the history that is untold, that is not known to understand who we are as a people, and not just for ourselves, but also for the rest of the world. Um, so um, I feel this incredible responsibility, and believe me, it is a huge responsibility. But little by little, I have been um, making video oral histories of all the artists that worked during that time and then artists who were also affected by the gallery, who were somehow influenced by the gallery in my mother's presence. And um, you can see this video, it's just three minutes and it will tell you the story of the gallery. Estábamos en el momento más caliente de la, de la guerra, ¿no? La muerte era el, el compañero diario de todos los ciudadanos, ¿no? En ese momento, nos, eh, con Nolasco y, y yo, estábamos haciendo una obra que expresaba la guerra en El Salvador, ¿no? Y, y prácticamente el, donde encontramos el, el, que, el que se pusiera nuestra obra fue en el Galería Laberinto. ¿no? El arte era una forma de resistencia hacia las fuerzas hostiles y negativas de, de muerte, ¿no? O sea, es cuando el arte puede cambiar a una sociedad. ¿no? It was 1977, at the beginning of El Salvador's Civil War, when Janine Janowski, a French immigrant and Holocaust survivor, opened Galería El Laberinto. The gallery became a haven for artists and open dialogue. Gran parte del público se da cuenta que quien da a la sociedad es el artista. Y entonces tiene una actitud, digamos, de mayor respeto hacia la obra de arte. 
lo que me parece notable. La Galería del Laberinto en aquella época era un referente, un referente que, que en un país, como tú dices, que no, tiene, no tenía museo. Yo siento que educó al público y educó a los artistas en ese sentido. Me pareció que formó una generación de artistas eh, más valientes, más que se pudieron expresar mejor. Fue pionera en, en ese sentido. Entonces era como que si fuéramos un colectivo todos. Lo más importante era que te hacía atreverte. Parte del asunto era que era como un salón de intelectuales que llegaban escritores, músicos, personalidades y, y pues todos era como un imán de llegar a la, a la galería a ver qué era lo que estaba pasando y por supuesto pues la reina del salón era Janine, ¿no? obviamente. ¿no? El ritmo de esta exposición está dado por la, los múltiples cuadros o cómo? Eh, Janine dejó un vacío, como dije, ¿no? No, es un vacío cultural y deja un vacío también en los artistas que trabajamos con ella. ¿no? Yo creo que es un vacío muy grande. ¿no? Janine closed the gallery in 2001 and she passed away in 2012. As an artist and as her daughter, I'm one of the many influenced by her vision. Her collection is the only one representative of the Civil War and its aftermath. I created Laberinto Projects to preserve this legacy in a digital archive and to foster research and outreach projects that connect to the arts of Central America and its diaspora. Thank you. So at each iteration of the class, the class does a different task. So the first class that did this was they had to do video interviews, and we traveled to El Salvador to do them. The second iteration, which was just this past year, was that they had to do an exhibition. So we all designed an exhibition where we were, it was going to be a legacy exhibition of Janine as well as the gallery. So um, we scanned through the archive, we you know, printed images from the archive, uh, we made a timeline, um, and we organized it, we designed it, etc., all together as a group of 12. Um, and um, then we went to El Salvador and we installed. And we had this amazing two weeks there where um, the artists came, we did a radio show, We had them come to the opening and did an open mic session where everybody just told their, you know, reminisced about what it was like. Um, and then at the same time, I had my own photographs, which I had done the last year of my mother's life and her space, uh, which are called Si Je Meurs, If I Die, which comes from something that she said to me. Um, and at the, so it was like that moment when I was installing my photographs Um, and looked over up to the other wall where my students were putting up the timeline. And I thought, this is it. You know, this is exactly what I've been doing all my life, <laughs> you know, through my career. I've been trying to establish a link between what's a personal story and what's a collective story. And with this particular story, it actually works really well because it is my own personal grief and then it is also a public, collective, important legacy that needs to be told and preserved. And um, so that's, you know, that was Laberinto Projects, and it continues. It has many iterations. I'm going back as a visiting um, artist again at the Centro Cultural de España, or the Cultural Center of Spain, who were my hosts last year. And um, I will... Um, create this other piece, which is um, a more engagement kind of piece, which is called Arte Voz, or uh, where I'm asking people to respond to specific artworks in the collection to tell a memory or a story. So we're recording all of these things, and they will eventually become a collective archive of voices and stories 
that when eventually you see the paintings or the artwork in a space, you will also hear people in El Salvador and people in the US telling their own stories. So um, these are just some examples from the collection. Um, it's a Central American collection, so it's, um, you have Erwin Guillermo, who's from Guatemala, uh, Julio Sequeira, who's from Nicaragua, uh, Carlos Cañas from El Salvador, uh, Jose Neri from El Salvador, Bernardo Crespin from El Salvador, most of them are from El Salvador, um, Luis Gonzalez Palma from uh, Guatemala. Luis Gonzalez Palma had his, one of his first shows um, in, at the gallery. Actually, it was a three-person show with me, my dad, and, and Luis. Um, also Luis Paredes, who is another photographer who lives in Denmark, but from El Salvador. And this is Arte Vos, which has begun, you know, as we've done like a series of pop-ups in DC um, at different places. And we're gonna continue in El Salvador. I'm engaging with the artists again, and they're going to be creating work also for an exhibition that we're gonna have in June. And so um, this takes me to um, Si Je Meurs, which is um, the current body of work that relates to Laberinto projects. I guess I'll read this. I practice saying goodbye over and over again, getting as close as I could to a wispy lock of her once chamomile curls and watching the light as it glowed into her room, as if I could ever get used to it as if the picture would somehow wish it away, as if it would make it any easier when she called me one day to say, I woke up this morning and death was next to me. It is time. Me desperté esta mañana y la muerte estaba junto a mi cama. Ya es hora. Or maybe she said it in French. What I found as I was making these pictures is that a lot of my photographs looked a lot like the artwork that was in the house. So for example, this picture reminds me of a Carlos Cañas painting. Um, and you know, it's kind of eerie that way that, well, of course it makes sense that I would have been somehow influenced by all this artwork because I grew up with it. Here's where that photograph comes in. So both projects are inextricably bound together, preserving her, her legacy um, in both intimate and personal ways, as well as public ways, um, just reinforces my belief that in the power of art to construct first-person narratives that affirm one's individual history um, and culture, and also galvanizes communities to come together with a new sense of collective identity. So that's my project and my work. Thank you. I'm happy to answer any questions. Katrina, yes. So I thought it was fascinating how, I mean, you said the obvious that when you ask other family members, they have 
different memories. Mm -hmm. But I'm wondering if you've um, experienced or can you explain why some people simply like deny something? You know, they, they might call you out as it, it never happened, it's false. Do you, I mean, now we're getting to psychology, but I'm curious about that. Um, well, you know, I don't... another hour presentation right there. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I can't answer why people deny things. I have no idea. Um, but I can tell you from personal history that denial is a very powerful thing. It, um, it protects the stories that we make for ourselves so that we can live, so that we can survive. Um, many times, I mean, at least, you know, just knowing how difficult it was for my mother um, to acknowledge her own history or her not, I mean, her, her being hidden in France, let's say, or her um, just, just that whole process. I mean, she was just a child, you know? Like, how could she have any other way of live, living her life when she was denied a particular language, Yiddish, she was denied a particular um, religion, Judaism, because if they found out, she would die. So, you know, those are really powerful things that we learn very early on. And so um, it undoes a lot of things of like, you know, keeping it all together from my own personal history. You know, I was a very, very shy kind of, in, I mean, I'm, I'm still um, not shy, but, you know, not hugely in, extroverted. So, but at that moment, part of the shyness was because I was holding all those things together, you know, like to be able to say, I am Jewish to a Palestinian person or vice versa felt dangerous to me. And in order to continue that, um, whatever it is that gets passed down as whatever it is that you need to continue living your life in a particular way, um, sometimes it just doesn't fit with who you are or it doesn't fit with the way that you're living anymore. But it was good at a particular moment in time, right? So that's all I can say, that it, there came a moment where what I learned from my family, the silence of assimilation or the silence for survival from both sides of my family, wasn't good for me as a person, you know? Um, it was a pretty destructive force at that point. So if I wouldn't have done, undone it, I would not be here today. I would not be this person, right? So I think it takes a lot of courage too, though. It takes a lot of work. It's not easy to acknowledge. It's not easy to dig into you know, the recesses of your soul <laughs> and try to figure out who you are. Um, sometimes it's easier to just put up blocks. Um, so I don't know. You know, art has a way of kind of breaking that up, though, you know, and, and creating new ways of, of being. Um, and so I think it's, it's, it's a powerful tool. Yeah, I think right behind. Um, do you find um, the United States as, um, being progressive in cultural realization, or do you believe that we're going backwards in terms of um, uh, inviting our cultural uniqueness? Because it seems that a lot of it is being very neutralized in order to fit in to the United States um, image. Hmm. Well, <laughs> that's a loaded question, but I think that um, there is, with the greater influx of um, peoples from the Americas and from other places who are, do not fit the narrative that the United States has created for itself, it is basically 
upsetting that narrative. And there's a lot of pressure for um, and polarization, extreme polarization because of that, right? So I think that there are places and spaces where all of those differences and hybrid identities are being acknowledged more and more, but at the same time, there's a huge backlash. You know, um, so I think that um, the media and the internet and all of that, like, just like, um, expands all of the all of the polar opposites you know it just kind of makes it go into as if they're the loudest voices but I think that there are other voices that really need to be heard and that it's all our responsibility to make them heard so that they don't get drowned out in this kind of noise of hatred so um, I think that, I don't know if it's becoming, if it's going backwards or forward, but I do know that I'm an optimist <laughs> and that I, um, I also believe in the power of construction of places that are equitable and just and that we all have a right to be who we are. So I would encourage you to do the same. I have a question. So I want to continue Katrin's question. So I have a si somehow have similar experience because I was growing with my grandparents, mm -hmm. and uh, I I never did any family shot. I mean traditionally fa family shot, but I re record some some um, some dialogue with my grand grandma. Sometimes I feel like you mentioned a lot of uh, identity. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you do artwork, so you mean the identity is based on the truth or based on what you try to present? Yeah, and, and what is the question that you have? Well, people's memories can be fed out right. years by years. Yeah. So, in the end of the end, so, I mean, what the thing that you're trying to say is based on the truth or based on your, your memory you're trying yeah. to... Mm. So truth is tricky, right? Um, I think that there is an authenticity that can be, we can aspire to authenticity. We can aspire to the moment, the, the, the truth of the moment, right? The truth of, of what um, we have experienced. Because we all are, like each of us has a particular truth that you know, we see through a prism of how we grew up, how we see the world, how we have been influenced by others, etc. So art has a way of kind of puncturing or intervening in these different ways that we look at our experiences and at what we call our truth. And your truth might be different from my truth. but. Somewhere in the way that you will express your truth and that I will express my truth, there will be some sense of meeting somehow, somewhere. And hopefully that's, that's where we can bridge the gap. Um, it's difficult to talk about absolute truths. But I don't know if that answers your question. Actually, uh, Garcia Marquez also said something along the lines that it, it's not the life you li lived, but the life you remember, mm -hmm. and how you remember it in telling it. Exactly. So. It's mm -hmm. that whole idea of the transmission of our memories, and even the silences are really important. You know, what's not said is as important as what's said. And how it is that we say it also matters. And so, the, the powerful thing is that in telling it, it's really um, empowering, to use the same word. Um, but you know, in telling it, you are actually building something. You're creating something. 
and you're revisiting, you're re-encountering, you're like, you know, putting it out in a different way. So. Hi, I, I guess my question is. Doesn't seem like the mic is working. No, it's just for the video. Oh, okay. Yeah, my question is that um, your, your project's very personal. Yeah. And at the same time, it's archival. You know, you're, you're basically um, telling history, but then at the same time, family history. So I, I guess my question is, your approach when you first started, how does that change throughout time? Because this is a 30-year project, and it seems like it's a continuous one that might be a lifelong project. So your outlook, do you see maybe your intent when you first started that project, has it changed? you know, maybe 10 years later down the line, or did, are there surprises or while you're doing it, or new discoveries? How does that work? Oh, discoveries all the time. I think the way that I would see it is that it's like growth as a person as well as growth as an artist is kind of parallel. You know, like each time that you, I mean, and from my point of view, because so much of it is autobiographical, so much of it has to do with the construction of a narrative, right? Um, and approaching different aspects of what I consider important in life, in my life, you know. Um, so there's different, different things that have been important. Like, you know, with Saints and Shadows, it was important that I was just kind of struck, like creating some narrative of who I was, you know, as a person. Like, what did it mean to be all of those things, right? Um, what did it mean to be able to say that I was Palestinian as well as Jewish? Um, what did it mean to put an Arabic Greek Orthodox prayer on top of the Isalka volcano, you know? And then eventually, what did it mean to tell a story, the story of my mother hiding when she had done everything possible to keep it hidden? Or what does it mean to engage other people in telling their stories? Um, there was one particular in the workshops that I led during the Fulbright, um, there was one very, very moving moment where um, somebody brought these family photos of a marriage, of a wedding, and it turns out that this person's grand, great grandfather was the dictator who had assassinated about 30,000 indigenous people in El Salvador around that Isalco volcano that I told you about. It took him three days to bring these photographs. It was an incredibly courageous act to bring those photographs in a group setting where others were going to hear him say, my great-grandfather is El General Martinez. It was a moment where people went to the other side of the room. It was that intense. But to have him say that for him as a person was incredibly important. Just like it was important for me to do all of this work, right? And then what was interesting is that I used um, there's a photo, he, this general was also responsible for creating a registry of foreigners in the 1930s in El Salvador. And all Arabs and Chinese people had to register in it. So my grandfather had to register in it. And I had already used the thumbprint of that document that was my grandfather's thumbprint in one of my photographs. But I didn't realize what it was until he told me of that story. Like he told, he showed me his photographs which were intimate family pictures, right? His, they were torn and because the grandmother had gotten upset when they got divorced um, and so had torn like the head of the grandfather and like, you know, they were like interesting photographs to look at, but they told the story of the country as well as the story of that family and my family as well. Because I had used the thumbprint 
from a document that my grandfather had to you know, register into because he was a foreigner, because it was an Arab. So all of those things like really matter you know, in who you are and how it is that you continue your life after that moment. It changes you. So I can't tell you like specifically, you know, I can give you so many, so many different um, um, examples, you know, like the moment when I'm hanging the photographs and I see the timeline on the other side and I see that relationship between what's very personal and what's very public. You know, that makes sense. That made sense to me. Um, so, or the moment when I'm photographing my mother and she tells me, I wish your father would have seen you, seen you now and what a wonderful photographer you have become. I mean, those are things that change you, you know? Those are things that are like, oh, she's giving me permission to photograph her. That's huge. You know, and they're all super important, intimate things that are part of our lives. And, you know, if we only were a little bit more open, we probably wouldn't be hating each other so much, you know, because we all have these stories. So, I don't know. I think it changes you. It has to change you. And hopefully others are, you know, encouraged to reflect on their own story when they see work like that. One more question. Uh, I'm, I'm curious if uh, your mother's gallery was caught up, if it was a tricky thing to be showing art, which uh, mm -hmm. tends to generate lots of different political viewpoints, if that was a tricky thing during the war. Um, it was an it was not a partisan place at all for any side. So all voices were welcome. So of course that, you know, makes it, it could make it really dangerous. But somehow it worked, you know, and you hear, I don't know if you remember Dagoberto Nolasco saying in the video, he says, I think, or maybe it's not this particular video because we also did longer, um, we did oral, I mean oral histories and so there's longer pieces on the website that you can hear. He said, Janine said, what's the problem? There are no bombs in the paintings. So, you know, somehow they managed. Um, you know, it, it was all kinds of people were in, from all camps, political camps, were in the gallery at the same time. So it was a really, really remarkable place. Well, that's all the, the time that we have, so we'll have to leave it at that. Thank you so much for the inspiration, Muriel. Thank you. Thank you for the right. Thank you.